Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. This is a very special report. Joining me in studio now is musical icon and great patriot Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins fame. Now you've obviously sold millions of records. You're back on the road and now you are joining us here in our new studio here in Austin, Texas. Welcome back. But this is the new old new yes. studio. So. Yeah, all the fans out there, all of your support helped to build this place. It's no longer a deep, dark cave of sadness. It actually is, feels welcoming. <laughs> Before it was sort of foreboding. Yes, very much foreboding, you know, which could be fitting sometimes within the info war. But so now you were on the Alex Jones show earlier today, and I thought it was just a really prescient speaking about breaking people out of this trance. And, you know, I feel like we're truly living the Orwellian nightmare. And it's almost as if it's been programmed and preparing us for this. And the Matrix is, is here. Yeah, it's really bizarre to me because I grew up, um, I was born in 1967. And in school, at a very young age, we read Animal Farm and we read 1984. And of course, what I took from that is, this is never gonna happen in America. And we had to all take the Constitution test. So whether I was being propagandized in the positive, I was being informed that America is not like this. To actually see, in my lifetime, America go from the world that I believed in then to the world I see now is, is, is literally mind-blowing. And to be participating not only as a, at the citizen level, uh, in the local community level, you know, I have a, a business where I live in, uh, in, outside of Chicago, and so I, you know, I deal with the local government and that type of stuff. But then also be a, a public person and be part of the zeitgeist at different times to be used and abused positively and negatively within the systems that exist today and see how my participation um, is, is a constant decision making between either, either am I helping, am I hurting, am I informing, or am I actually enslaving. Mm. Um, that's a difficult uh, thing to take on. Yeah, so to, to learn that, you know, what the collectivist vision in Animal Farm in 1984 is, was actually our future and not this preventative thing kind of blows my mind. <clears throat> I can't believe we're even having this discussion, if, if you can understand why I say that to you humbly. To be talking in America in 2016, you know, about, you know, Mao's a good idea and, and uh, uh, a socialist is running for president and that's okay. And we're going to go back to these kind of crazy tax rates where we're going to completely disempower the innovators in our country mm. because the new class, uh, the new technocratic class wants to keep their position and they want to keep anybody else from coming in the game. I mean, that's just crazy to me. So Yeah. How do you think people can get around the millions of people that were murdered under these communist regimes and just say, well, you know, that just happened then. But and here's, here's the thing. You know, obviously I listen to you and I, I listen to Alex, and I listen to David Knight and Jakari. I mean, you guys do a fine job of identifying the factual route. And of course, sometimes because you don't have all the information, you have to speculate. And as I once told Alex, literally sitting in this exact spot, you don't always have to be right. You just have to have the right intention to want to get to the truth. As long as you want to get to the truth and that's your intention, that's fine. But what I would say to you, and I say this very plainly to you, is that most people don't care about facts. Most people do not care about facts. I work in the entertainment business. The people in the entertainment business do not care about facts. They only care about facts when it involves a gross. We spent this much, how much do we make, how much do we lose? Up until that point, it's all in their mind. So for most Americans or most people listening internationally, it is in your mind. Mm. It, it literally, you are fighting phantoms that do, do not exist. Now, if you're intelligent, which I think most people that listen to this show are, are you don't see how you've been engineered and steered and people are heavily invested in convincing you of something. We all know the, the advertising model. Uh, women very much understand from a very young age, you start being told, you gotta look like this, you gotta think like this, you gotta do this in your hair, blah, blah, blah. Young men, it comes a little bit later and it usually comes through sports, which is why it's so heavily invested in sports. The beer, the culture, the bro, the blah, 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 blah. Okay, we all understand that and we don't, it doesn't really bother us. We like when a clever ad manipulates us to want us to buy a certain product or something. What we don't realize is, think about people who have trillions on the line getting you to believe a lie 
or lean you a certain way so that they can achieve some end that's 10 years down the road that you don't even have the read for. So imagine here's somebody like Alex coming and he actually has the read or he's talking to other people who have the read and they can see 10 years down the road. You, you sit here in this spot and you present those facts to people and they go, what does that have to do with me? Right. So to me, the next stage in the info war is to get at the ground level, at the cultural level, which is where most people interface with the propagandizing and the manipulation and help them understand. Because I think most people's natural human instinct when they realize they're being manipulated is to get mad. Because ultimately it's an insult to their intelligence. Right, or to deny, 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 because they don't want to admit that they've gotten, they've been had. Or, or uh, disenfranchise their sovereign right to make an independent decision based on fact. Now, most people don't care, like I said, if it's, they're being manipulated and buying a product. If they realize that they're ultimately enslaving themselves to a system that's not only going to hurt them, but it's going to hurt their children, that's when their instinct kicks in. Right. And that's when fact doesn't matter, right? So you can present people fact all day. If they are hypnotized, they are not going to hear you. They're conditioning your children. And so you'll see some of these Disney cartoons and things like that. Mm -hmm. We spoke about Shutterbug time where it's this bug that's a drone that's spying on kids and it's just conditioning them to be completely okay with constant surveillance, reporting back to central command about whatever it is that you're doing inside right. the privacy of your own So home. let's explore that for a second. Now I'm on the entertainment side. I'm in these meetings with people. I recently had a meeting with a big studio that I might participate in. Those people at the ground level are not part of some governmental cabal. Right. They might even themselves be okay with those ideas. So on the realm of opinion, somebody working in a big studio could say, Leanne, the, I, I've been friends with the creator of that show for 20 years. It's got nothing to do with government surveillance. Okay? And you could say, well, I disagree. So an observer would sit back and say, well, Leanne has an opinion, and this person over here who's invested in the series and put capital, and they believe in it, and they love it, and they think it's great for children or whatever. You, you present it as... Have you thought of it like this? My perspective is, this is something that kind of, if, if I was a parent or, or uh, thinking of my own nieces and nephews, this kind of troubles me, and here's why. So what, all you're doing is you're presenting kind of a, a range of ideas to someone and letting them make the choice whether or not that's something they want their children participating in because maybe on their uh, particular range of belief, they don't want their uh, children conditioned to believe that surveillance is okay. Because even if you can make an argument for surveillance is okay, a lot of us that grew up in the, in the 60s and 70s, we were told, don't trust strangers. Because, uh, you know, there was a rash of a, a pedophile incident. I grew up around when John Wayne Gacy was killing kids. I mean, I, I literally lived down the road from where that happened. So you can imagine being 10 years old and hearing about kids being murdered and put in basements. I mean, it terrified us. So suddenly all the parents were like, don't trust strangers. So something as simple as that, which maybe has no... Uh, nefarious undertone. Still at some point a parent might say, well, I don't necessarily want my kid watching that because I don't want them to trust authority blindly. Right. I want them to use their own minds. So I'd rather have a, a show that's more like it's teaching them how to think for themselves and problem solve than I want a show that's telling them it's okay to be observed by a stranger. And that's not to assign a nefarious intent to the creator. And it's not to say you have to be right. You can just raise the question and it's really more about the, the cultural discussion of whether it's appropriate in the wider culture to accept these ideas as normalized, which is where I get funky on that. Right. I don't like the normalization of things that really need heavy, intense peer and cultural review before we kind of stamp and say, that's okay. Drones, for example, is something, as particularly as a person in public life, and I would guess you as a, as a as young woman, that's a troubling thing. If you have to think every time you're near an open window and you're taking off or putting on your clothes or you're picking your nose or something, <laughs> you have to think, is somebody watching me and is this going to end up on a system? And is, this, is that 10 seconds going to haunt me for the rest of my life, particularly in social media world where I can be tagged? And basically you work here, you're a public person. So those are issues you have to think through. So why isn't there a greater cultural peer review about the proper use of drones in, in, in situations? Why isn't there a, wide, a more wide-ranging discussion? That, to me, is a discussion we should have as citizens. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I know, for instance, when I switched over my phone to an Android, not even thinking about it, I didn't realize that you had to turn off all of these 
uh, systems. And at one point, I just randomly discovered that my phone had been tracking my most visited places. And hey, isn't this great? Don't you want everyone to know where the where you work, where you live, where you shop? No, I don't want any. I mean, that's yeah. it's frightening yeah, to me. At one point, I'd link some social media thing to my phone. And as you can imagine, I have a lot of famous people in my in my phone. And and that social media system went in my phone because I downloaded the app and poached all the names and had posted them on the Internet. And I remember talking to somebody from the company and they were like, well, those are private in the hacking world. No, exactly. Hello. Yeah, that's it's not private to people who have broken into the government office there in the right. Pentagon and have exposed okay. your. These are things that we should discuss. So I like <laughs> the idea and, 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 and pushing for, uh, you know, and I and I think you're the perfect person to approach this from that systemic review. From the standpoint of the info war, are the are we okay? Are we okay? okay here's a new show. Are we com are we comfortable with these concepts? Here's a movie where, uh, you know, the the director of the movie is openly called for open borders. Mm -hmm. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with the messaging in the movie? Is that okay? Do we want to participate that on a cultural level? And I'm not calling for boycotts. I'm an artist. I'm calling for an open, free society that deals with these ideas equally and fairly. And that collectively, in the right use of the word, we can come to be a, a better cultural uh, point of view. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that, like, literally, okay, I'm, I'm talking to you, right? I could say a one word right now that would destroy my career. I could use the wrong racial epithet or say the wrong thing to you or look down at the wrong part of your body and be castigated. And it's a meme and I'm a horrible person. Every day through the media, through, through uh, advertising. We see people being degraded. We see people doing all sorts of things that should, we should be horrified as a culture. So we've normalized all sorts of, sorts of things, but now we live in a world where one word can destroy your life, right. but it's okay to, if you're a social justice warrior, spit in somebody's face. Right. That's okay, because you have, uh, you've been, uh, you're a victim, so it's okay. Right. So under the same ideology, uh, I didn't like the way uh, you, you spoke to me early, so I should be able to, denigrate you because that's okay. I mean, that's that's where we're, we're losing the plot and quickly too, I would add. Right. Well, and that's something that is kind of a big issue right now is it's this whole cultural racial thing where um, you can't say anything if you're white. There was actually the white privilege conference that just took place, the 17th annual one, who knew? Um, but <laughs> God, I didn't get my invitation. No, I know. <laughs> so, but there was a, a woman who had attended and she was tweeting out how the white speaker took too long and that's like the I actually that's I actually did read that perfect example of white privilege he went actually, over his time and here's now here's that's a perfect example okay I'm the type of person I saw that report I was fascinated by it I actually went to the woman's Twitter account and I read a bunch of her tweets because as somebody in public life I know not to just take your word for it I wanted to see for myself what is the messaging? What is the perspective? Maybe she said one dumb thing and she said 10 things that were really wise. I want to learn. So you can, if you can bring that into a wider frame, I think that's very, very helpful to people to encourage investigation and not just take it. Because at the end of the day, if, all, if, if this is propaganda one and they say you're just propaganda two, then it's always going to be an argument, who's got the moral high ground? Right, and we definitely see that in the comment section, that people are like, oh, well, this is that and this, you know. Uh, Leanne, you're a yeah. privileged white woman. You have no right to say that. Right. So by engaging in the wider topic of uh, free speech, uh, libertarianism, um, supporting values which you're not, you don't agree with, but, but, and, but at the same time sort of calling it for what it is, you know, you can engage without having to shut it down. Right now we have like a whole movement in the youth. These people truly feel this is, this is their civil rights movement of their time, and they feel like they're on the right. And so if you, for instance, if it's a, a Trump, anti-Trump rally, they think that people on the Trump side are just racist, homophobic, xenophobic, shut it down. I don't want to hear anything you say because I'm on the right side of history here, and I don't even need to hear your facts. And so how do you um, kind of educate these people that possibly their ideas aren't authentically individual? My argument is you can't. They're too far gone. And that may sound pessimistic, because I know that you're, you want a solution-based concept. Um, I think when somebody reaches the point where they literally cannot see a human being on the other side of the argument, um, and, and I'm not even talking about religion, okay? I'm talking about humanism. 
uh, the law, as it's constructed in Western civilization, is based on the idea that uh, a human has a, has a sort of a sovereign right to exist. Uh, and, uh, of course, people argue about when that life begins. That's a different subject. But the point is, is this sovereign right has a vote. They have a life, and they have a right to live it pursuit of, and then we obviously have a different idea in America. So when somebody has reached the point where they literally do not see that person as a voice, a vote, and they have a story, and they have a family, look, I've said it before, I grew up around a lot of racists in my family. <clears throat> Would I call them bad people? No. Would I call them misinformed? Yeah. Was that, a, was that due to experience? Do they, do they have a right to their belief? They would argue that they had a right to their belief because something happened in 1984 and they had some guy from a different race say something and, and they were never going to listen to that race again and anything to do, okay, that's racist as I, would defi as I would define it. When you reach a point where that person cannot even respect that person across them's path to arrive at a particular point, then what's the discussion about? You have no right. So you're talking about disenfranchising. There's no discussion. Their, their tactics in the social justice warrior movement are to, are to stifle and shut down free speech. And I would argue in the, in the, in the world of, uh, that I live in, which is the bare knuckle world, um, they're leveraging their position because they don't have power. Now, of course, their argument is they, they've been systemically disenfranchised by systems, right? Pick your poison on that. They might even have an argument. Okay, but at the end of the day, if you don't recognize the leverage that they're using, you ultimately come back to the same conclusion, which is they don't have power because they are not on the moral high ground. The moral high ground would be, I want to engage you because ultimately I believe that my argument will win over your argument or I will place something in your heart like the mustard seed, like Jesus talked about, that will grow and make you realize the error of your ways. That is not what this is about. It is to shut you down, to leverage a minority position, and I'm not using the word minority in a racial pejorative way. I'm talking about groups that statistically don't have leverage to just vote their way through. How do we kind of see through that knowing like, okay, this is a, this is a kind of an evolutionary step that we as humans need to take versus, okay, now I'm being told that this is what I'm being conditioned to accept I, socialism. I instance. think if you're curious, you have to start by separating the truth. I think admitting to yourself your own truth is always a good place to start. Like when I watch some of the clips that you guys have been putting up at some of these protests, I have no respect for what these people are doing. I don't. They're shutting down free speech. They're shutting down processes that I, I just don't get it. To me, it's antithetical to the, the society that I believe in. And as I said on Alex's show, they're eventually going to come after me. It's just the way history works. Okay. But, dot, 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 I try to listen to their argument. And where I do recognize the argument as having merit, I try to consider it, and then I try to think into terms of practical application. In essence, don't become them. Mm. Don't shut your ears, okay? Try to understand the forces at play. It's hard to tell someone who feels disenfranchised by the system or the, you know, the, the, the government or whatever the world they live in. Uh, you try to tell someone here who, who you know, you might argue is taking advantage of our social welfare system or, or gaming the system somehow and say, look, you have it and you're telling me America sucks and you're spitting on the flag. <laughs> try go living in one of these third world countries and see how far that gets you. Um, you know, it's always very interesting to me, and this is a very prickly point to make. It's very interesting to me when you see the way uh, gays and lesbians are treated in some other countries in the world, the level of, if they have that level of vitriol for, let's say, Donald Trump as a candidate, because they feel it's antithetical to what they believe in, where's, where's, the, where's the five times greater condemnation for those societies that mm -hmm. are treating their people? Far worse right. than just words and ideas. I mean, it's always interesting to me that how people kind of pick their spots. Mm -hmm. that, that always rings a, a, it's like a red flag for me. Mm -hmm. That means they're really not in it at the real level. Right. And, and then you start realizing, look, most people are trendy. Right? Most people are trendy. For every five hardcore people that are there, they're spitting in your face. There's 50 people there just doing the. They just want to be a part of the scene. Yeah. 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 You. You know. <laughs> Racist, you know, it's like they wouldn't even know what it means.
What do you think about that, that we have people um, wanting to take away what makes this country so great and it gives them the right and the, the freedom to go out there and say whatever they want, and they want to now chip away at free speech trying to say, well, it's offensive. And so should, should offensive speech, should you be allowed to do it? You know, not everyone's offended by speech. So okay. how do you... That's a fantastic question. And I'm going to say something that I think is probably uh, the most important thing to me in everything that we're talking about. Um, we all remember the cartoon, you know, uh, Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam or whatever, and draws the line. You don't step over that line. He steps over the line. And he draws another line. And right. Okay. For me personally, we're at the last line. Free speech is the last line. So if you're saying to me, look, what's more important, identifying with social movements that do have valid and real concerns as they see it from their own perspective and community. In essence, their voice does need to be heard and respected, even if at the end of the day you don't agree. Okay, if that can be done while, at the, at, at, while maintaining free speech, in essence, we're kind of a rolling Linus ball of dust and we're just moving forward as civilizations do, great. I'm more than happy to have that discussion. I'm more than happy to have that discussion with politicos, people in the entertainment business, social justice warriors. And I've had these discussions through the years with, I mean, when I, when I talked about God in the 90s in my songs, you know, the, the right-wing preachers came at me. I was, uh, one of my proudest moments was I was uh, picketed in the last year by the, the... Westboro? Yeah. I was like, wow, badge of honor. This is awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm actually still dangerous, right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. To me, and I hope this makes sense because I'm rambling a bit, but the free speech line... Without free speech, none of those arguments matter. Right. Not a one. Because once we lose that, there's no end. And I'm sorry if you're a student in history, and I've read plenty of books, uh, you name it. If you've ever seen The Killing Fields about Pol Pot and, you know, the Khmer Rouge, uh, you know, what Stalin did, you know, obviously what Hitler did, any socialist system, which tend to be left, by the way, just a little point in there, once you cross that line, okay, you look at every totalitarian regime in the, in the last hundred and something years, who do they kill first? They kill the disabled, and who do they kill next? They kill the artists, okay? Why are ideas, as John Lennon once sang, imagine, da, 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 why are ideas so powerful? Because they are. They are the thing that cannot be defended against. Mm -hmm. An idea, a whisper, a rumor cannot be, no wall can stop the truth, right? So... No matter what side you're on, left, right, libertarian, you lose the free speech lane, it's over. Because we all lose. Mm. Every one of us. And I don't care who you are, where you come from, where you're at on the wheel. Okay, Which, why is, which does explain sort of in the, in the greater zeitgeist of the idea why the mega wealthy and the elites are preparing to go off grid, off planet, buying lots of land in Costa Rica or BC and all that stuff. Because they got the quarterback read, and they see when that fur goes, it's going to fly. Yeah. We don't want to get there. That's my point. Once we lose that lane of free speech in this country, it's over. It, it might still be called America, but it is over. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what your trendy argument, I don't care what your hashtag argument is. If you do not stand for free speech, you do not stand for America. That means you want something else. And if you think your something else is going to be better than America, I'm here to tell you you're wrong. And I will fight that fight to my dying breath. Because, look, I was propagandized as a kid to believe that everything America did was great. And like a lot of people, as I got into the world <clears throat> in the 70s and 80s, I realized that wasn't true. America has done plenty of horrible things. Start with the Native Americans and work your way backwards. <clears throat> so I'm no, you know, America's perfect, you know. I, I've never believed that, nor did my father. But I do believe America is better than any other political and social system that's ever been created in the world. Prove me wrong. I'm willing to listen. But we're Americans. We love our country. And if you're a true American, you even love the enemy. Right. So we can cry and laugh and, and shake our heads at the social justice warriors. True Americans and libertarians want them in that system. Let's have that argument. Well, and on that note, so with the social media, is kind of the the engine where a lot of these social justice movements is kind of gaining momentum 
but it's also where they're being sort of corralled and controlled as well. So they can take your free speech and hide that line of code so it never trends or uh, the algorithms will just shut down and you won't be able to reach your audience. And so talk to people a little bit about how to use these systems for, for good or to use, you know, vote with your dollars or your feet, so to speak, to, to not allow them to start controlling us because they, they truly are. A lot of my friends are what I would qualify, quantify as average American citizens my family. What do they do at a participatory level to either encourage or discourage things that they don't agree with? And I think it takes a little bit more savvy if we're in the info war. It takes a little bit more savvy to know how to get into those systems in a way that we can leverage our own position, just like the social justice warriors do. Um, but at the same time, not resort to the kind of the scummy part of it all, which is sort of leading people astray. Um, look. When you use the word liberty, um, most people don't find that word sexy. You know, racist has a lot more ooh, ooh, ah to it than libertarian. Libertarian sounds like you're stuck in the back of a truck with Ron Paul and he's talking to you about like, you know, freedom. policy papers and freedom. It doesn't <laughs> sound very exciting to me, okay? You know, I, I tend to like the social argument. <clears throat> you have to start, this would be my argument, you have to start by identifying that the most powerful thing in the world right now are these technocratic systems that are in place, search engines, uh, the way we connect on these, on these social platforms. Governments have either encouraged these things to come along or quickly realizes that they were the new element, arms of control. And so you have to ask yourself whether your participation in these systems is actually enslaving you. Then you have to drill down a little further and you have to want to ask questions about um, if what you're doing and participating in is, is truly uh, as open as it seems. So if Twitter, for example, is full of people of a diversity of opinions and you feel like, hey, it's, the, it's, it's capitalist, it's my idea versus yours, who tweets more, who gets more retweets, who says the right incendiary thing, who does the right mean, great. That, that's America, great. And I would only argue, you know, where, where do you cross the line? And you see it all the time. I mean, uh, uh, Infowars puts up articles. Uh, as somebody who's in the in the world, and I have to watch what I say. When you see a page that's literally, and the page is the Facebook page is assassinate Donald Trump, and and I believe Facebook comes out and says that doesn't violate our standards and practices. Yeah. Okay, that's where so, somebody like myself has to ask: Is my participation in the Facebook system, and I would call it a system, am I actually encouraging something which, as an American, I find offensive? Mm -hmm. And I also find it offensive that a business would support. You can call. I would have no problem with a page that said Donald Trump's a racist. Donald Trump's a homo. Uh, Donald Trump's a homophobe because because that's just opinion. The minute you talk about killing someone, <clears throat> sorry, that's where you need to step in as a business. Say I will not support that. So why does that? Why is that okay? But you can imagine what page you could create on Facebook today, and there would be calls for you to never work here at Infowars ever again. Right. That's that's where it gets funky. So you have to be sophisticated enough to look at those systems and say, is my participation encouraging something that I know deep down is intrinsically not only flawed, but counterintuitive to what I, what I want to be part of? Mm -hmm. And in essence, your participation is condonement. Now, I run a business. I have a Facebook page. I need the Facebook page at this day to run my business. It's an effective system. I don't like everything. So that's just another piece of information that may ultimately push me off Facebook. And I'm willing to take the commercial and public hit of not having that reach that I have to the four million plus people that follow us on Facebook, because at the end of the day, I as an American can't support that. So does it bother me? Yes. Do I have to have the argument in my head? Yes. And to this point, I haven't made that decision. If you're not having that argument in your own head, then you're not participating. And then to use Alex's term, you're just a drone who's just following around and you're pretending you have no influence and you do. Mm. And I think, too, it's really time for a lot of us who are libertarians and who are for freedom and who are concerned and who do, we're not kind of in the trance. We do see, we do need to start coming together and working and setting up our own systems to counteract their systems right. that they have. That's why I would use the word empowerment. Empowering people with, let's not call it the facts and the truth. The facts and the truth are always kind of ephemeral. It's just eye of the beholder stuff. 
empowering people to have a better range of decision making as far as how they approach their social systems, I think that's powerful. Then if you take the extra step and you say, uh, like maybe Infowars sets up its own version of social media so that like-minded businesses are able to participate in a system that is ultimately holistic mm -hmm. to the ideas that you would believe in. Yeah, some open source social media networks as well. To... I think those days are coming soon. Yeah. <clears throat> and trust me, if 20% of people suddenly jumped off Facebook, they would notice. Yeah. They look at those numbers every day. Just right. like I would notice if suddenly there were 20% empty seats. <clears throat> well, it's like you have these huge groups like the Soros-backed groups there, that they're, they've all joined together now, all these little minority movements, they've all decided to come together, and now they are of a smaller majority but the movement. Beauty of, and so people are, you know, you got to understand what you're up against with you know, these machines. Again, from a, from a capitalist free market position, I don't have any problem with that. If, if seven independent hot dog stands band together to form a hot dog association because they need to leverage their position in the market, great. They should have the right to do that. The thing you know, though, and, I, and, and you know it, and you can know it in your heart, and I'm going to say it right to the camera, <clears throat> they will all turn on each other. The left always eats its own. Mm. And the minute they gain what they want, they'll turn on each other because they're rapacious and they can't help themselves. Yeah. They have to have a cause. Their identity is born of the cause. There was a great article that came out when the gay uh, marriage, the, uh, the Supreme Court, all that stuff, okay, gay marriage is now part of the law of the land. Okay, there were articles about people being depressed because the movement was over. They'd won. Yeah. You know, if that was your argument and you wanted it and you got it, great. That's an incredible victory if you, that's the side you're on. And having grown up and watched people die of AIDS and, and being part of that in my own particular way, I thought, good, great. You got what you wanted. Got to go on to the next thing because it was about the identity of waving that particular flag. The victory was not in the thing. The victory was in the march. Yeah, being a part of that big movement. So and understand that's... a lot of these trendies, the minute the thing gets boring or it gets too hard or it breaks down into policy, social movements are easy to begin. You know, you're being disenfranchised. Yeah, your vote counts. Yeah. When you get into the level of policy and regulation and sitting, like I have at the local civic board meeting for four hours and they're talking about water mains, that's where most people, that's where the trendy stuff out. stops. Yeah, they'll yeah. tap out and or they'll turn on each other. So at least in your own heart, when you watch them uh, abusing InfoWars reporters, no, they can't, that, they, they're, look in 20 years and see where they're at. <laughs> they, won't be, they won't be still twizzling the, the New Year's toy, guarantee you. Right, yeah, well that's why a lot of people point out how, it, it, for instance, Bernie Sanders isn't really reaching a lot of people that are 30 and up or even 40 and up, because it's a lot of just young people that don't necessarily have the experience. 46% of Americans don't pay any form of tax, at least in terms of federal or state. Of course. Free stuff, great. Give me more free stuff. Yeah. Sounds good, Sounds good to me. I'll no take freedom. One. That's just why I'm for free Bernie. Stuff. I want more free stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, Billy, thank you so thank much you, for Andy. joining us in Total studio. Pleasure. This is kind of the first of a series of social, cultural, Breakdown. It's we're going to be doing. the beginning of your own yeah. personal revolution. <laughs> yes, indeed. Our individual, true individual ideas. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. People ask me, what is the most important area of InfoWars that 
runs the whole operation that is having such a big effect against the globalists. And I've said it over and over again, it is you, the listeners and the viewers, that send us the intel, the news tips, that support the broadcast, that spread the word. You are 90% of the operation or more. You don't stand beside us, you stand at the heart of InfoWars. When I talk about the people at InfoWars, from customer service to the shipping department, being just as important as our anchors, our researchers, our investigative journalists and myself, it's absolutely true. Without this team that we've built over the last 20 plus years, we wouldn't be able to do any of what we've been doing. And that's what's so exciting because we finally built up to a point where we now have the launch pad. Introducing AutoShip for InfoWarsLife.com, a new way to save time and money when you stock up on InfoWarsStore.com products. Again, ladies and gentlemen, when products are sold out, you're unable to get them, sometimes for months, but we hold back the products for people that have already signed up for AutoShip. When you choose auto ship before checkout on your order at InfoWarsStore.com, we'll give you 10% off and give you guaranteed delivery of out of stock products that are on your auto ship list. Plus, we're giving you free shipping on all orders above $50. Listeners have been requesting this for years because it's so easy to forget to reorder the products when you need them each month. Now it's finally here. Auto ship at InfoWarsStore.com and InfoWarsLife.com. It's easy, go to InfoWarsStore.com, select your favorite product, click on the auto ship, and choose how often you want us to send you another order. As you know, I coined the term 360 win, and with the new auto ship feature at InfoWarsLife.com, it's a sure win. You add to that free shipping on orders of $50, it is a can't lose. Visit InfoWarsStore.com and save 10% off on your next InfoWars Life order by selecting Auto Ship at checkout and get free shipping on all orders above $50. That's InfoWarsStore.com or call toll free 888 253 3139.